Okay. Dear um, friends across the globe, um, good day. My name is Fernando Gomez. I have the, the privilege to, to be involved with a series of initiatives in the energy and materials uh, space here at the World Economic Forum. And on behalf of the forum and, and uh, the partners with whom we are working in this major effort called the Mission Possible Platform, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, materials industry session. I see um, the thousands of participants in this online event and, uh, and, and you're joining from all over the world. And I don't know your specific location, but, um, but I would like to ask you to uh, just take a moment, no matter where you are and, and, and look around you. The, um, the, the built environment where you are, the clothes you're wearing, the, the electronic device that you're using to access this, uh, this session, um, clearly your world and, and our world is a materials world. And, uh, and that world that you just saw around you is the result of, of a number of industries transforming raw materials into shelter, into, into roads, into consumer goods. Um, but there are a couple of important things uh, about those transformations that these industries uh, make every day. Number one is <clears throat> they will continue to deliver uh, indispensable socioeconomic well-being in the future. And, uh, and, and they have so far and they'll continue to be there. But the second is that to continue delivering that they will require energy, lots. And at least until today, that energy means uh, high emissions. And that's the reason why um, we talk about a transition of these industries into a different realm. Now we say transition because it's a major overhaul of what we have been doing for a long time. And we say accelerating as well because um, very pace steps may take us uh, somewhere, but not necessarily to the major transformation that we're talking about. It requires an acceleration. So the Mission Possible platform is a space exactly for that. The leaders across all stakeholder groups to come together um, to, to build that collective vision, to commit, and more importantly, to enable that, to make it happen. Um, our colleagues in this panel will tell us how they are facing this, their, their vision, and the steps they're taking towards uh, this transformation. So with that, I welcome you all. And, uh, and I would like to leave you with uh, Bronwyn Nielsen, who is going to facilitate the session, joining us from South Africa. Bronwyn, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando, uh, for that introduction to our session. We're certainly in for a robust discussion um, today. And uh, just formally again, we we're looking at the materials industry transition, building forward at speed and scale. Now, we've previously heard about the critical role that that industry must play if we're to meet the Paris Climate Agreement objectives and net zero globally by 2050. Now, if we, after, we had a very insightful session on, on heavy duty transport uh, just before this. And in that session, we examined a number of themes. We're gonna build on industry transition day and now deep dive into the journey that the materials industries need to continue taking towards that net zero emissions. And, and perhaps we just put a, a couple of stats on the table and, and we go back to 2018. The aluminium, cement, chemicals and steel industries recognized as the harder to abate sectors accounted for 5.8 gigatons of CO2 emissions. Now, just to put that into context, that's 68% of all industry emissions and accounts for more than 16% of total global emissions. If no action is taken, emissions from these sectors could double by mid-century. And as demand for these industry products is expected to increase substantially due both to population growth and the need for materials to support the low carbon economy, these industries face important questions on how to meet this demand and uh, while significantly reducing their direct and indirect emissions. And then we're going to explore the challenges that the, the steel, aluminium, chemical and cement industries are facing in decreasing those very emissions 
And we're also going to identify in the second half of our discussion, the public, private, private and cross industry collaborations needed to accelerate the journey of the materials industries towards those net zero emissions. A couple of ground rules uh, before we get started. The session is being live streamed and, and will be recorded. It is open to the press. Uh, please could participants keep themselves on mute uh, when other speakers are engaging just so that we can monitor our, our virtual um, platform at this point. And then also, if I could kindly ask the speakers to keep to their allocated um, times in, in order to allow each of the panelists to contribute equally to the discussions. Before we go into um, and deep dive into uh, the content of our discussion, I'm going to introduce you to the Slido platform. Uh, you can uh, go to slido.com and you either scan the QR code, um, which will give you direct access or you can, as I said, go to slido.com, hashtag industry transition day. And we are now going to go into um, a discussion point where I'm going to put a key question to all of you. It's important that we have your participation at this stage. So hoping that you have managed to, to get into Slido and you will now see on that application on either your smartphone or your um, a, any smart device that you're operating on, the, the question that we will put to you is of course, um, of all the below necessary actions to drive the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in the materials industries, which one do you believe has the greatest potential to accelerate their transition? Access to cheap renewable energy, development of new production technologies, development of truly circular material cycles, financial levers, carbon pricing or taxation mechanisms, and policy or regulatory levers. And we'll be polling those, as you can see now, We've got access to cheap renewable energy coming in at 28%, dropping slightly there. We seem to have uh, still holding its own access to cheap renewable energies at 24%. So policy is, is certainly leading on this. Um, and we can see that if we go further down, we've got the policy and regulatory levers definitely leading as per what we can see on the poll. So without further ado, let's go into um, introducing our panelists and also just reflecting on, the, the, on those results. Um, all of those levers can play a major role in supporting the decarbonization of, of heavy industries in, in different ways. And of course, which one can be most impactful differs per sector and makes the transition to net zero complex for companies and policymakers. Right, without further ado, my first panelist, Mahendra Singhi, is the CEO of Dalmia Cement India. Now, Dalmia Cement is one of the most active and innovative climate leaders in the Indian business world and part of the leadership group for industry transition. I am joined also by Jörg Unger, Senior Vice President, Corporate Technology and Operational Excellence at BASF Germany. BASF is the largest chemicals producer in the world and has been one of the sector's leaders in addressing the sector's greenhouse gas emissions. Welcome. We're joined by Amelie Hignon, Managing Director of Aluminium Dunkirk, Alvins. And uh, Aluminium Dunkirk is the largest aluminium smelter in Europe, and together with its parent company, Alvins, has been working actively in improving aluminium's carbon footprint. We have Nikita Vorobiev, Environmental Affairs Director, NLMK Group, Russian Federation. NLMK is the largest steel producer in Russia and exports its products across the globe to over 30 countries. And uh, Cedric de Moos is a head of group, group Public Affairs and Government Relations at Lafarge Holson. 
Lafarge is one of the best known building materials companies with a large cement business and has been leading the sector's decarbonization efforts. Right, so if we go into our first, as I said, we're breaking this up into two parts. And, and the first part of our discussion is really understanding where all of these specific industries are in their decarbonization journey. The first overarching question is, as I've said, how far is your industry on a path towards net zero emissions? And what are the biggest challenges to be addressed? And, and York, we're gonna start with you in this discussion. The chemical industry is highly complex and has become very fragmented in the last 10 to, to 20 years. Can you help us understand where the bulk of chemical emissions is coming from and what the industry is doing to directly ad address this challenge? Uh, perhaps how far are you from achieving net zero emissions as an industry? Jörg. Yeah, thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, I will try my very best. So first of all, you're right, the, the chemical industry Industry provides a broad range of materials. And this broad range of materials is created in integrated value chains. Uh, and these value chains, they are rooting in relatively small num in a relatively small number of fundamental building blocks. For example, olefins, aromatics, and ammonia. And these building blocks, almost like Lego blocks, are then used to assemble more complex materials that provide the desired properties and functionalities. Therefore, and this is a uh, specific for the chemical industry, the carbon footprint within the chemical sector strongly depends on where you are in this chain. Therefore, it is difficult to really come up with one commitment of the entire chemical industry. Rather, we have to tackle it from a company or group of company subsector uh, approach. Why is that? Particularly the production of these building blocks that I mentioned uh, from different raw materials is very energy intensive. And this is the root of our uh, CO2 intensity. Oil and gas are particularly attractive raw materials because they can be used as both the raw material on one end and the energy source. In today's petrochemical processes, the production of the building blocks is driven by internal combustion by a portion of the raw materials. This has proven to be very, very efficient and is the foundation for the highly profitable petrochemical and plastics industry. Clearly, the internal combustion also creates CO2. So there is no way around that. And uh, this will add cost to our balance sheets and will also probably not in the future be further accepted by public and regulators. So for these reasons, we have some challenges and we have derived some action areas. First, we need new production technologies, which really decouple the energy supply from the raw material we use. Therefore, we develop new technologies that allow for the use of green energy instead of internal combustion. Second, we need to ensure access to sufficient green energy in an increasingly volatile electricity market. We do require relatively large quantities, but in principle, we can offer buffering capabilities by coupling the electricity grid with our material value chain grid. As an industry, we are actively exploring the opportunities and constraints of this so-called chemical electrical interface with the energy supply and distribution energies. Third, the use of renewable feedstock really enables a carbon neutral footprint. However, to enable a net zero footprint, we also have to get involved in the circular economy. Therefore, we actively support circular economy solutions that keep carbon in the loop and avoid carbon leakage. Our recently founded uh, Alliance to End Plastic Waste is a visible sign of our commitment. Conceptually, all three areas might appear straightforward, but making them happen in practice is really a challenge within and beyond our industry. Our current technology and asset base is highly efficient, but capital intensive. New technologies will not only require development, they also require a, a, um, the support by regulators and financial uh, communities because new technologies are most likely less competitive than the existing technologies. So early movers clearly have a disadvantage and will be driven out of business if not supported. Nevertheless, I do see the chemical industry as an opportunity. We can offer a lot to a future net zero industry because we can serve 
as a value adding tool to manage our volatile energy supply demand balances on the one end. And secondly, we can reduce carbon leakage by closing the loop for a broad range of materials, building blocks and functionalities that we deliver. That's it. Amelie, let's turn to the aluminium industry, uh, which is obviously well known for its recyclability and, and being lightweight, therefore, therefore reducing fuel consumption. Nevertheless, the production of aluminium is also known for its intensive energy usage. And as the largest aluminium smelter in Europe, how are you specifically addressing this energy challenge? Yeah, thank you. Uh, as you rightly pointed, uh, we're known to be energy intensive and uh, we also have the issue of our own process that generates uh, CO2. So we've got a double challenge uh, on that front. So I'll tackle one and then the other. On the first, uh, the process aspect, uh, you know, just a couple of numbers. Uh, we have a range of producers that are between 1.8 and 2.8 tons of CO2 per ton of aluminium. Um, we have the chance of being benchmarking that field at our smelter, and that has been going through process improvement uh, through years. Now, if we look at technology, how can we reduce that on the process side? Uh, everyone's been on a quest, actually, to, uh, to look for the solution, and it requires a complete change in the chemical process. There's one player in the industry that's actually seeking that opportunity that's called Elysis with a new technology it would be breakthrough that's uh, called inert anodes. So it would actually remove the CO2 uh, process. You know, it would be a completely different one. So until they actually prove that process to be, uh, you know, feasible on an industrial scale, we have no solution in terms of process. So we're doing marginal improvements, but uh, we, are, we don't have the answer yet. So process-wise, it's either we uh, suppress completely the carbon or we capture it. And carbon capture is still uh, you know, far from providing a complete solution to our industry. So we'll have to keep working in parallel on those ones. The other source will be the electricity we use. And some of us have the chance of having zero carbon coming from the energy because we come from low carbon uh, you know, sources of, of power. Uh, we're partially decarbonized at Dunkirk, which is a great advantage. Some have hydro power sources, so it makes them also very competitive on that front. And others in the world have up to 15 tons of CO2 that adds to the process side. So all the players in this industry are, are working on both. Um, our total is 2.3 tons of CO2 per ton of aluminum, which is uh, pretty low. So we keep working on power sourcing and on the technology side, which are the two levers. Recycling is also one, uh, which is, you know, you simply don't make the aluminum first. Uh, it still is energy intensive and it needs to be developed mostly with our clients' clients to achieve the desired quality and the, uh, you know, the real carbon improvement. Uh, it needs to be done properly. So there's still a lot to be done on that front and uh, it will provide some benefits. Nikita. Bronwyn, we cannot hear you. Apologies for, for that. Thank you very much. So uh, turning our attention now to the, the steel industry and uh, Nikita bringing you in at, the, at this point, the demand for steel is expected to, to grow by 30% uh, until 2050. And if no action is taken by the middle of the century, the stat is that steel could account for 8% of total global emissions. So it's an internationally traded commodity, obviously, and we've got to look at what some of the key hurdles are that the sector needs to overcome to collectively meet the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, Nikita. Yes, uh, thank you, Bronwyn, and uh, hello, everyone. So uh, the global energy consumption and CO2 emissions um, per ton of crude steel uh, have uh, already been halved since 1960s, so we already made some uh, way through and uh, we've had uh, a whole new part of the industry emerging um, steel made through electric furnaces which recycles crap so it's 
it's becoming more and more recycled product. And um, uh, its carbon intensity is already four to five times lower than, than that uh, of the traditional steel produced through the so-called integrated route. And uh, today, this new route uh, represents about 30% of the global steel production. And uh, here it's important to mention two things uh, about steel. Well, first of all, Bronwyn, as you already mentioned, it's one of the most traded commodity uh, products. And since uh, it is produced and sold globally, it's increasingly important to take collective measures to reduce CO2 emissions. And second is that steel is fully recyclable. It doesn't lose its characteristics or qualities when being recycled. And uh, that is a crucial part of the circular economy and indeed uh, a net zero transition. So in terms of what measures have already been uh, implemented by the industry, uh, it's uh, the hydrogen use as uh, a reduced inhibitant, uh, which uh, helps to significantly reduce uh, CO2 emissions, even in the traditional uh, production routes. Uh, it's, of course, the use of uh, CCUS technologies, which is costly, but uh, yet uh, also efficient. It's an increased use of uh, biomass uh, as a reducing agent as well to substitute coal in our production. Uh, and it's, um, again, uh, something that has helped the industry to, uh, to, to, to transition uh, quickly. Uh, what are the challenges? Well, I, I wouldn't be um, unique in saying that the renewable energy availability is by far number one. And uh, Europe alone would need about uh, 400 terawatt hours of CO2 free electricity by 2050. That's seven times more than the sector produces today. And that is uh, the European steel sector is less than 10% of the global production. So I can understand the scale. Second is, of course, the technical challenges in introducing um, carbon neutral technologies at the existing sites. Uh, we have dozens of pilots running worldwide at this point, but a truly global scale uh, is yet a challenge. And third is, of course, the cost. Um, total cost of production will rise by uh, 35 to 100 uh, percent per ton of steel by 2050, and that's the cost of uh, using uh, new technologies and uh, more uh, energy. And uh, of course, that, that cost uh, has to be bared uh, both by producers and by consumers. And that's indeed a challenge. Thank you very much. Cedric, let's uh, bring you in from, from your perspective now. And again, just putting some stats on the table around half the emissions from cement are process emissions. And this is a principal reason that cement emissions are often considered difficult to cut. Uh, if I can add to that, since uh, COT is released by a chemical reaction, it cannot be eliminated by changing fuel or increasing efficiency. How is the cement industry, Cedric, particularly overcoming this challenge? Okay, thank you, Rani, for the question. It's, it's, it's a very broad and complex one, and I can't speak of the behalf of the sector, but I think it's fair to say that Today, we have technologies. We have technologies that exist and can be uh, expanded, such as a, a, a fossil fuel substitution. It's part of it, uh, uh, but not the whole, the, the whole solution. We have solutions in development, such as uh, carbon capture and storage, carbon capture in use. And we have technologies that uh, require cross-sectoral partnerships uh, that are currently being envisaged. And, and all of these can be used uh, uh, to achieve carbon neutrality. If you look at certain regions in Europe, the European cement industry released its 2050 roadmap, uh, which shows how these technologies can be used to achieve carbon neutrality across the value chain. Now, or end, there's one thing we're still missing, which is the business case. The business case for um, carbon neutrality, the, the business case for investing massively into these technologies and the deployment of these technologies. The business case for uh, uh, investing in this technological transition. Um, and, and what do I mean by, by, by the, 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 the business case? For instance, you need to incentivize these technology transition. Carbon capture and usage, if it's not incentivized, it's not going to be bankable and projects will not emerge at the pace and scale that is required. Um, 
Another example of the business case is the need for a, a level playing field on carbon costs with um, importers. Uh, unless we have that level playing field on carbon costs, it's difficult to build a business case. And all of this will require an unprecedented collaboration between industry and governments to build up the, 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 the legislative and regulatory framework uh, that will enable that, that transition and that will give us the business case to go faster further. And the last point, Rani, I would like to make is, is that of the, uh, uh, of the value chain. In several parts of the world, we have launched uh, um, carbon neutral concretes onto the market. We need to build up the demand because the demand remains niche at the moment. So that needs a, a transformation in the collaboration and the relationship we have with our value chain and, and the way uh, um, uh, customers and actors alongside the value chain behave and integrate carbon neutrality in their thinking, in their behavior, in their decision making. And, and how do we do that? And that is through public procurement, building codes and standards, uh, um, carbon pricing. We probably require a different form of carbon pricing that it really embeds in, in, into a, a decision making across value chain. So all of that needs to be considered to build the business case. Let's turn our, our attention now to the cement industry. And Mahindra, I'm going to ask you to come in here. Of course, Dalmia Cement is a member of the leadership group uh, for industry transition, and that's led by India and Sweden. So how, how is the Indian industry, would be the fair question here, advancing their transition to net zero emissions? Mahindra. Happy morning, happy afternoon, and happy evening to all. Namaskar. Thanks, Brownman. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting question, you know, like one, uh, the proactive and positive efforts of Dalmia Cement on carbon neutrality has been very well recognized. And that is how we are member of this uh, India-Sweden transition group. Secondly, many of the European countries, they have taken roadmap, they have created roadmap for going to net zero by half of the century. But still what we find is that the industrial sectors, they have not come out with their roadmap that how, whether it's steel or it's aluminum or cement or uh, aviation, they would reach to that level. So that is in process. Now, I, to answer your specific question, the industry in India, they are broadly aware, but at the same time, the awareness, like from low carbon to the net zero carbon, I would say candidly, not only in India, but in most of the developing countries, that awareness is not there. Uh, this uh, message of net zero, it has come up in say last uh, few months or so, and I think it will take up. But at the same time, the good part is that the Indian government and few of the leading companies of India, they are fully aware of it. Indian government has taken many policy initiatives by uh, supporting renewable energy, by uh, supporting various other measures like uh, e-mobility, etc., which can bring down. But at the same time, there are only very few companies in each sector. And if I take just uh, name of few companies like uh, Tata Steel, Mahindra and Mahindra Group, or Hindalco, or SpiceJet, or our company Dalmia Cement. So there are only few leaders who have started working on low carbon transition. Only thing uh, which I can share here is that our company, Dalmia Cement, is one of the companies who have targeted for carbon negative by 2040. And we are quite happy and thankful to ETC and Lord Turner and few other organizations on the support of which we could visualize that there are the technologies because so far our organization ha has the lowest carbon footprints in the world, 525 kg per ton of cement against 900 kg global average. But at the same time, the challenges before steel sector, aluminum sector, or cement sector is that how to how to implement certain technologies which are in our uh, vision. Like our minister had said earlier in the morning that there are few countries and companies which have means but not the will. There are few companies and countries which have will but not the means. So we, as a company of India, we have the vision. We have the will but not the means. 
so so the major challenge which is required by uh, to be uh, addressed is how to create some demonstration projects for certain technologies which are breakthrough so like this uh, my friend cedric said that carbon capture and utilization now until unless that is made business case that is demonstrated to the industry that this can be one of the major uh, game changer for the industry nothing would come out so like we have reached to a certain level but now to reach to net zero we would need a, a demonstration project which can be funded by global carbon fund or any mdbs you know uh, you are aware that as per paris climate agreement developed country was supposed to support developing country by more than 100 billion a year but without that support the technologies which are in uh, know how of uh, indian industry uh, it's not coming up so the few more challenges one the right policies in india and developing countries for the promote renewable energy secondly how this fossil fuel can be replaced one by a biomass or alternate fuel and one of the project which we have suggested for the uh, not our industry but everyone is how to plant energy plants like bamboo etc on the waste land and uh, uh, unused land so that uh, that also uh, acts as sequestration also as well as the replacement of fossil fuel mahindra i just want to bring and the the you. audience in here thank you so much for that i want to bring the audience in here obviously key is interactivity with our audience and we have got questions coming through um from slido just remembering if you want to join us here you can scan the qr code or go to www.slido.com and enter the code industry hashtag #industry transition day so an important question coming through who will pay the price of green products in developing countries steel will become twice costlier same is the case with cement so who will bear the cost uh, who who would like to to come in here nikita yes. uh mahindra go ahead maybe we can just do a round circle on all of you on this one mahindra sure so 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 i would say that uh, initially there would be a big cost uh, so that's why investment would be required to be funded by mdbs and all this but in long term uh, i can definitely assure and which we have shown to the whole world that the philosophy of clean and green is profitable and sustainable so maybe after 3 years after 5 years 7 years whatever benefits you get by capturing co2 by replacement of fuel etc that would pay back and the cement would not be expensive nikita let's let's get a response here from you sure i, I would actually like to echo mahindra mahindra i think that you know a one time cost would definitely be there and the, as i mentioned in my uh, initial speech it would have to be split between the consumers and producers that's for sure uh, perhaps the government is uh, can intervene at this point uh, as well and uh, provide some support to reduce uh, that cost uh, to the public uh, but uh, in the longer term again as we uh, as we can uh, enlarge the life cycle of, of of the material industry uh, we can definitely make it more sustainable and not just cleaner but also cheaper that's uh, that's also amelie uh, let's get a, a sense from you here Sure, I'll be along the same lines as my co-panelists. I think uh, you know it'll take a, a you know a lot of public policies to uh, to enable that, uh, both supporting the initial investment. I think right now, uh, as some pointed out in the same in our industry, the barriers to entry on some of the technology is really high. So you know it'll take support for the very long-term investments. Uh, I also agree that consumers will have to bear some of the costs. I hear the question about you know uh, developing countries. I think same you know there will need to be some support for those countries in particular so that they don't lag behind uh in terms of decarbonization. Jörg uh, response from you and then Cedric I I would like you to conclude on this round. Very simple answer Brendan everybody. The question is how do we share it? And this will be the the task uh, on hand because whatever we do will be more costly. Uh, as a society and as as industries we were used to digging something out of the ground keeping the value and releasing something into the atmosphere without any cost and this is changing uh, 
So the big question is how do we share this additional cost coming into the equation? Uh, and this really requires then the financial industry to think about it, uh, the industry, the actually producing industry to think about it, the consumers to think about it, the regulator, because in the end it will be more cost and we have to share it in a balanced way. Stronger shoulders will have to carry more and weaker shoulders less. But the question is how to define this. And this, I think, is a very important piece in the discussion. And Cedric, if you could just come in before we move to collaboration and the second half of our discussion in uh, the, the materials um, industry. The, the carbon neutrality agenda is, is, is a, a societal agenda. Carbon neutrality across the economy means that the carbon cost must start to be embedded in the products and services that we provide. Uh, and <clears throat> That requires carbon pricing schemes to be developed and that embed both the emissions and the consumption. Uh, and here the role of policymakers is fundamental to enable the transition towards that uh, um, so that it doesn't create economic shock neither on the production side nor on the, con on the consumption side. Right, so we have uh, 24 minutes left for our discussion. And as I said, we're, we're turning now to the, the second part, which is about collaboration. Um, and if we, if we look at the, the critical dimension of this panel, it has to be public-private collaboration. And this, of course, is not uh, unique to the materials sector. It, it is something that we are driving across uh, the broader discussion points on uh, driving for zero emissions. So if we, we look at, uh, and, and we start here with Mahindra, Let, let's go back to, to Dalmia Cement. And as mentioned before, India is leading the leadership group for industry transition. How can public-private partnership help your industry to achieve climate objectives? And could you illustrate how this collaboration works in India? Again, if I can bring you down to around three minutes on, on your response, sir. Thank you. Sure. Definitely, until unless there's a collaboration, nothing new can come out. And the collaboration of countries are required, collaboration of industries are required, and collaboration of certain uh, societies are required. So one of the important uh, uh, platform is this Mission Possible, which has been, uh, come out, which has converted the fundamental of the industry from hard to abet to possible to abet, and now the Mission Possible. Now the government, the industry, the financial institutions, and the uh, MDBs, they all have to come together and create certain projects by which one can, again, I'll repeat the same, so that they can demonstrate certain projects by which it can be shown to the industry that if certain investments are made in uh, these uh, technologies, then definitely it has uh, potential to bring down CO2 emissions. And ultimately, like in uh, India now, what when we have a targeted carbon negative roadmap of 2040, there are four major levers. One major lever is uh, renewable energy by replacing thermal energy. Government of India is supporting in a big way. So there is a uh, close interaction and cooperation between Indian government, the uh, technology suppliers, and the Dalmia cement. Second is with the agriculture sector, government, and the industry that how to uh, put up energy plants. And now the third and most important would be the uh, carbon capture and utilization, like uh, earlier just said, that uh, it's a 50% of the emissions which comes out and until unless carbon gets captured as well, it gets utilized as a raw material. And now there, the industry collaboration of chemical industries and other industries, as well as cement industry, and industry Mahindra, I, I want to pick up on, on that coming back and, and actually just a small correction. We're going to go to two minutes um, in terms of right of response on each of these questions. Cedric, let's pick up on that carbon capture uh, utilization and, and storage. It's one of the key technologies required to, for, for addressing CO2 emissions in the cement industry. Both the oil and gas as well as the chemical industry are working on it. So what other aspects could be addressed in cross-industry collaboration? Cedric. Yes. Look, what we need is many more large-scale projects that bring different industry, different sectors across, across all the three routes. We either use carbon capture for geological storage, 
we capture for using carbon as a, as a feedstock or we capture to remineralize, remineralize the, the carbon. We need projects across the three routes and the three routes need to be incentivized in order to render these projects bankable and make sure that more and more of these projects are emerging. We've, we've announced two in Europe. We, we need, it's not enough, we need more. Um, the second point I would like to make is that if you look, for example, at the geological storage, if that is to, to happen uh, on a large scale, this is an issue which is much bigger than the cement industry. We need a massive rollout of carbon transport infrastructure. Uh, we need a, 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 a broad base acceptance, societal acceptance for carbon geological storage. Uh, uh, and this is bigger than ourselves. This is bigger than just a sector. This is a, a, a a societal transition that needs to be enabled through the political system with society and across different sectors. Nikita, uh, let, let's come in here. And, and companies such as NLMK are developing their corporate strategies regarding addressing their respective environmental impact. Where do you see strong opportunities for the steel sector to collaborate in this space? Yes, thank you, Marwin. Uh, I see a number of opportunities. Well, uh, first, if you take the uh, intersectoral cooperation, we are already um, launching the dialogue with a number of oil companies, or what Cedric mentioned uh, uh, about the geological storage, and uh, also with uh, chemical companies, which can uh, use the CO2 produced by us in uh, uh, their production cycle, uh, which could also be efficient. Uh, uh, also, I think what is important uh, is to uh, find a way to uh, collectively invest in R&D because that is uh, always costly and that's not something that just uh, one company can bear or even one sector can bear. Take the uh, R&D uh, in um, producing, efficiently producing renew renewable energy. I think that's indeed an, uh, an intersectoral need and uh, that should also be uh, supported uh, by the government. Uh, if you also take uh, such uh, uh, platforms as uh, Net Zero Initiative uh, supported by WEF, uh, I think uh, it also has its role in uh, developing, um, in describing uh, long-term trends uh, in the carbon intensive sectors and uh, analyzing the potential to accelerate the transition. So looking uh, not just at the one industry, but at a number of industries and uh, on a global scale that also helps not just us as an industry, but us. it also helps our government to understand how all of the industries should uh, transit to in order to meet the net zero goal. So Amelie, we, we already spoke a bit about the need to address the question around energy usage in the aluminum sector. What other areas do you see in terms of, of the ability for collaboration? Well, the uh, energy usage is indeed one, but it is going to come back to each individual's matter. So the technology part is really the one where there can be uh, some collaboration, uh, either across you know, the industry itself. And in that uh, area, I think uh, you know, R&D projects uh, carried out together you know, will help to bridge that gap. Otherwise, it might just take years before we find a solution. So. Uh, any uh, policy supporting joint R&D uh, you know, within the sector and then across industries, I think being non-competitors, uh, that should help, you know, some collaboration. So obviously carbon capture is one where, you know, as you're mentioning or, you know, um, others, it's something that we can work on together and have a network, have a, you know, technologies and go faster. And also about the acceptance, uh, because it's, you know, just the plate, you know, moving the issue somewhere else. And uh, it always comes with, uh, I think, also our licenses to operate from an environmental point of view are harder to get these days. So it's not just about suppressing. If we move it elsewhere, the public acceptance needs to be built prior to that. So um, I think, you know, those are just examples of how we can uh, go faster. Uh, by working across the industry. Uh, you're bringing BASF back into the conversation. Uh, the chemical industry supplies chemicals and materials to all manufacturing industries. How can collaboration with your value chain partners help in decreasing emissions associated with your products? 
Yeah, and I think I showed before that I think we can have a, a very, very central role in this. We could be something like the spider in the web between even the material and the energy world. But this requires uh, new types of collaboration, both within our chemical sector, but also beyond with other sectors and the uh, regulator, because we have to share the risk and the burden of this technology transformation. On our end, this means also, again, three elements. First, uh, in, a, in order to enable circular economy, we have to get in touch with our customers, the users of our products. We have to come up with materials that are designed for recycling. They work in their intended use, but they have also the capability to be recycled at the end of their life. This requires not only technical solutions, but also regulatory work that allows us to sort, collect, and process waste and transport it uh, in an efficient way. Second, access to green energy, I said, is a key element. And here we really have to work with energy suppliers and with the distributors in a highly regulated and fragmented uh, uh, environment. Lastly, uh, and this is most in our own hands in the chemical industry, we have to come up with new chemical processing technologies, but this also requires new ways of collaborating. First of all, not everybody can be involved in all initiatives to develop all kinds of technologies. So we have to kind of split this up, but then reunite it to really leverage the capability of the entire industry. So lastly, I think the Mission Positive platform for us can really help to foster and facilitate a more holistic view uh, on the future industry landscape. And this is necessary to cope with the challenges on hand. And I think it really helps to establish uh, habits beyond our regular business habits by linking our activities to other industry sectors, the regulator and the finance sector. I want to bring back our audience participation and a couple of questions coming through on that interactive uh, platform on Slido. Remember, you can go to slido.com and you can register with the hashtag Industry Transition Day. So let's just quickly talk about COVID-19, although it's not a quick discussion, but I do want to understand how COVID-19 is impacting this debate. And if I can go across the, the panel, Mahindra, let me bring you back in here. Uh, definitely COVID-19 has impacted human activities also, as well as the economic activities also. But as far as said, uh, our company is concerned or mainly cement industry is concerned, they could act proactively and they could also find opportunity in this by having more, uh, better relationship with the society, taking care of the people and getting closer to the people. And we follow the philosophy of physical distancing, not social distancing, but social closeness and virtual closeness. At, at the same time, now there are certain uh, planning that is, once we are uh, broadly over from COVID-19, that what more efforts has to be taken because COVID-19 has shown that one pandemic has uh, can create such a havoc, but then climate change impact would be more havoc than this pandemic. So now people are aware that yes, we have to change our habits. We have to uh, adapt ourselves to the new normal, which we say better normal. Amelia, I want you to come in here in terms of COVID-19 and the impact on in the industry. Yeah, so COVID-19 has been, uh, you know, the industry, our aluminum industry is characterized by the fact you can't just switch off a smelter and restart it. So our whole industry was not uh, capable of stopping the activity. So everyone kept on going. And I think if uh, we can talk for, you know, our company, uh, we, we did well through, uh, through the period by, you know, being very resilient and going very fast to adapt to the situation from, um, you know, sanitary, you know, measures point of view. Uh, we were also helped by the fact that aluminium is necessary and required, uh, you know, for medical supplies, for food wrappings and a number of things that had to go on as well. So it provides some meaning you know to our employees and uh, people to just continue so that's how we we went through so we just helped to restate our you know the requirement for aluminium is there and uh, that it's quite a resilient industry so you know it gives us hope as to finding other ways to cope with other issues and Nikita, bringing it back to, to how COVID-19 has actually impacted this debate specifically with regards to to your industry 
Yeah, thank you, Bronwyn. Well, uh, for, I think uh, what it, it, it had an impact on the demand, first of all, of course, and that put an additional uh, pressure on the costs on top of the CO2 cost that I mentioned. But at the same time, we also see that it could be a chance for opportunities. And uh, we see that the European Union has not only uh, stopped on its uh, Green Deal uh, push, but actually accelerated uh, its efforts uh, to put Green Deal further and uh, thus uh, pushing for the demand for green steel as well. Uh, and uh, we are also now uh, looking at uh, the steel, not just uh, from the perspective uh, of its uh, final use, but also from the perspective of uh, hygiene and health. And uh, that is also you know, some new qualities of steel pretty much that uh, we are looking at and developing now uh, that could bring additional value, not just to us as a company or industry, but to the consumers, first of all. So, uh, in, Jürgen, in I want you to come in as well. And Cedric, uh, just on the COVID-19 element before we move to a closing, closing question. Cedric? Go, go ahead, Jo. <laughs> okay, uh, may, maybe um, just just very, very simply. In the past, globalization was heavily driven by uh, cost of labor and availability of raw material. Uh, and I think this is changing. Uh, we have a lot of discussion about uh, supply chains uh, and the topic of uh, local production for local consumption uh, will be different, I think, going forward. Also for us as a material, base material provider to a large scale, uh, to, to many industries. So um, I see a change there, subscale, not world scale, but market scale production uh, and local production for local consumption, local material cycles. I think this will clearly be fostered by the experience we have been going through through the last couple of months. And Cedric, let's close out on, on this point. Two, two small points on my side. The, uh, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, as far as Lafarge Olsim is concerned, has not shifted at all our priorities as far as the carbon agenda is concerned and, and, and our investments. And in, in fact, we've announced last week a, a new carbon capture and usage project in, in Austria. The second element are the green recovery and stimulus packages that are emerging, including in Europe, and the, the strong green angle, in inverted comma, of the stimulus packages will play a fundamental role, an important role to accelerate the rollout and make sure that the pipeline of innovative projects that does not die out in a uh, in, in a more cash restricted environment, but on the opposite, uh, are incentivized, encouraged, and can be tested across. So we see it as an opportunity, in fact, as far as the carbon agenda and decarbonization is concerned. I want you all to listen very carefully to the closing question, and I want to see who is going to volunteer to take this discussion forward. Of course, if you feel passionately, we'll have more than one volunteer on this. But coming through again from our audience is we've spoken about collaboration with energy players and, and how crucial that is. We've spoken about the need for policymakers, and of course, that came through in the initial question that we put uh, in terms of the poll to our audience on the Slido platform. But one thing is clear um, that we, we've got to look at, as a, and that is costs. And it's really about bringing the, the financial sector into this equation and into the collaboration. Uh, any easy, uh, fast tracking on bringing the financial sector into this play? Again, I'm, I'm going to take now to volunteers. Who feels most strongly uh, about this yes. question? Yes, Mahindra, there you go. Yes. Yes, the financial sector definitely has to play the role and the developing country has to be supported like, like the chicken and egg. So developed countries should act as chicken and they should support the egg developing country and the demonstration project, they have to be created. And second one, uh, the, my message would be, though we would be thinking about net zero transition, but it should be just net zero transition. Let us think about... Uh, Society, economy, and the global warming. Thank you. And we've got time to, to take one more a reaction on that question. Any takers? Yes, if I may. Okay, Cedric. I think in, in order to, to answer the first question, fast tracking, how we bring on the financial sector, I think it's the, the, um, the foundation there is to develop coherent metrics and, and, and measurement tools. And this needs to be done together with industry uh, sector by sector. In Europe, we're working on, on the so-called taxonomy. Uh, it, it's complex, but equipping the financial sector with the right metrics 
um, is is fundamental and the only the only way to accelerate this uh, this this um, uh, onboarding of the financial sector. Wonderful. And I, I think on that note, we're just going to look at a closing session. It has certainly been incredibly interesting to, to get all the industry players across the board and just reminding you who we have had on this panel. I mean, this certainly has been um, experts in, in the materials uh, sector across the board. Uh, we were joined by Mahindra Sengi, the CEO of Dalmia Cement, uh, India. And, and just reiterating that Dalmia Cement is one of the most active and innovative climate leaders in the Indian business world and part of the leadership group for industry transition. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Jörg Unger, who is Senior Vice President, Corporate Technology and Operational Excellence, BASF Germany, BASF, the largest chemicals producer in the world and has been one of the sector's leaders in addressing the sector's greenhouse gas emissions. Amelie Hignon, Managing Director, Aluminium Dunkirk, Alvins, and Aluminium Dunkirk is the largest aluminium smelter in Europe, and together with its parent company, Alvins, has been working actively in improving aluminium's carbon footprint. Nikita Vorobyev, who is the Environmental Affairs Director, NLMK Group, Russian Federation. NLMK is the largest steel producer in Russia and exports its products across the globe to over 30 countries. And Cedric Demus, he is the head of Group Public Affairs and Government Relations, Lafarge Holcim, Switzerland. Lafarge is one of the best known building materials companies with a large cement business and has been leading the sector's decarbonization efforts. You couldn't have asked for a better panel of experts to lead this discussion. Thank you very, very much for joining us. And uh, I would love you all as audience participants to share your feedback on the Slido platform. Again, please go to www.slido.com and uh, enter the hashtag, hashtag Industry Transition Day, or you can scan the QR code. We would love to have feedback on the session, uh, remembering that, uh, of course, the next session will be in 30 minutes. That's at 1.30 CET. Thank you very much again to all our panelists for the robust discussion and taking uh, the step in driving the materials industry to a transitioning industry. Thank you very much. Thank you.